CEE Central Europe Explained An IDM podcast series powered by Erste Group Episode 11 Becoming an EU member part 3 with Katalin Tunnel Huber and Ambassador Klaus Wölfer Hello and welcome back to CEE Central Europe Explained my name is Sebastian Schaeffer. I'm Managing Director at the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe in Vienna. In our last episode, we talked about becoming an EU member together with Katalin Tunnehuba, Head of the Unit of EU Enlargement at the Ministry for Europe and International Affairs, and Ambassador Klaus Wölfer, Head of the Department Southeast Europe and EU Enlargement, as well as Special Representatives for the Western Balkans at the Federal Ministry for Europe and International Affairs. Ambassador Wölfer is also a member of the board of IDM. Welcome back to the second part and thank you very much oh. again for your time. In our previous episode, we left off with also the challenges for the societies that enlargement brings with itself. And when we um, look at one of the challenges for the European Union, uh, we can see is that uh, the countries need to learn uh, from the past. And, and there's always an argument, we've heard this in, in our podcast as well, um, that there should be a common cultural uh, policy within the European Union and that we need cultural reforms in the EU. And uh, we should not forget that the public is an important social driver in this uh, process. Now, both of you have been responsible for the Kulturforen in London and in Rome. How would you evaluate the importance of such reforms in the European Union and what would be the next steps? Maybe, Ms. Huber, you can start off this round. In the last episode, we, we spoke about the um, sort of um, the time it takes uh, for countries to join the European Union and this long perspective. And I think with uh, a European cultural reform, that's uh, that would take even longer. That's my, my personal um, impression. Uh, I was uh, director of the Austrian Cultural Forum in London from 2017 to 2020. And um, in this time, we saw major development with uh, Brexit and European colleagues uh, in London, we said we, we have to demonstrate a sort of um, European presence and, and show that um, there is a European Union in the, in the cultural uh, life. Uh, but in these three, almost four years, it was very, very difficult to agree on joint cultural projects and to show a big presence. So there I saw culture is such a national, still national topic and so dear to the core, to the hearts of, of each country. So to be very honest, I, I don't see some especially reforms in the area of European um, cultural policies in, in the near future. Ambassador Wölfer? Well, when you say cultural reforms, I don't really know what uh, what is the, <laughs> the issue of it. Um, I mean, the Western Balkan countries, or the Balkan countries in, in general, I mean, they have been part of European mainstream uh, for ages, um, in some way or the other. Uh, the Balkans were partly um, in the realm of the Orthodox uh, world, partly in the Catholic world. We have uh, very modern, mainstream Western European kind of uh, theater in, in Croatia in, uh, in the 16th century. We have a um, uh, wonderful musical life. And in, in more recent times, we have had uh, in uh, what was then Yugoslavia, just think of the film industry uh, in, in those countries, in the in individual republics, but which were then uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, you had great directors, Dusha um, Makaveyev, but already uh, in, the, in the 60s, 70s. Uh, and they were fully part of the European um, landscape the cultural sphere. I have the privilege of having lived in that time in, uh, in Yugoslavia, what was then called uh, Yugoslavia. And I can witness the, the way that already then and long before uh, the productions and the thoughts in the cultural sphere of Europe were also totally shared and presented as countries in Yugoslavia. 
uh, theater plays, uh, the best ones from uh, Paris, Vienna, and, and Moscow were regularly invited to places like Belgrade or to Dubrovnik. And uh, so I don't really see any anything for the, uh, the successor countries of Yugoslavia to uh, sort of uh, feel um, minor or, or um, needed to reform. I mean, they ha just have to let their um, talent bloom and blossom uh, and be shown um, in, in the world. So that is one thing. Then the more institutional European uh, thing is another one. Again, here, having worked in this field also for some time, I see a, a very positive development. The European Union is getting less shy to also uh, be active in the cultural field. Tünde Hubert just mentioned that it's basically still a domain of the national states, uh, fostering uh, arts in, in the world. But lately, the European Union is becoming more assertive, and it should be uh, so. We, we need to um, create and develop a stronger cultural profile. We, the European Union as such. There have been uh, bright uh, minds in this, um, in this part of the world who have theorized about it. Uh, I think of Rem Kohlhaas, for instance, the great um, uh, designer and architect from the Netherlands, and others, of course, who have uh, underlined how important it is for Europe to create identity, also to do a kind of what, what some say is propaganda, but to have a profile, a profile, a profile of the European Union, which is a different story altogether. But it it has a bearing because um, we, the European Union, face a kind of competition in the Western Balkans in this field, a battle on for the hearts and minds and emotions of people. And it is it is nothing wrong basically, but there is a competition, and the Chinese and the Turks and the Russians, of course, and everybody tries to underline their special links, their cultural traditions, binding together Moscow and Belgrade and, uh, I don't know, Istanbul and, uh, and Skopje and, and Vienna and uh, Sarajevo. It's natural, but there is a, a very healthy and positive competition to uh, also to uh, underline and uh, develop and recall these long-standing cultural links that there are and that connect all of Europe, including every single place in the Western Balkans. So you would say this is a two-way process, um, because what you have described, and that when you were in what at that time was called Yugoslavia, that, of course, the influence came from what is now the European Union, but would, it, would you say that it is also the other way around? Um, that, Definitely. Yeah. If, if this is not um, one of the, the top priority challenges, I would like to ask you, Ambassador Wolfer, what are the future challenges, the most pressing challenges for the region when it comes to EU accession? Well, uh, the rule of law is not just a word. It is a um, reality that has an immediate strong bearing on every individual life. Uh, a person living in uh, any city or any uh, uh, village of, the, of, of any of those countries of the six countries we're talking about, uh, is swayed by the fact or by the question whether uh, access to public health service is, is there, is uh, without uh, having to pay under the table uh, all, all sorts of uh, monies. Uh, if uh, university or school diplomas are uh, within reach, but again, fair and not subject to corruption and to payments, uh, if uh, you can be arrested only under certain circumstances. These are things that are really uh, fundamental importance to the lives of people, and uh, they are facts that decide on people, even of a certain age, whether they stay there or they join the European Union by moving away into the European Union. This is the fact. We have not touched upon the uh, subject of emigration, which is huge, and which is, uh, is not just uh, want to gain a little bit more uh, in Austria or, or Germany or Sweden, but it's also motivated very often by the fact that people want to make sure that their children who are growing up already uh, can attend proper and good public schools, uh, live in a healthy environment where uh, air pollution is, is banned and overcome. These are the, the subject matters. So, and, and it, it all boils down to the rule of law. Once you have a system where law and uh, progress can really uh, flourish, then uh, people will not only stay, but will come back. 
And this is the really the goal that one should uh, keep um, in, in mind because uh, we in the European Union countries, we may profit, so to speak, from immigration, which is very often uh, very educated and, and trained people who join EU countries from uh, the Western Balkans. Uh, but in the long run, it, it, it's not good. It's not because we have no, we in the European Union have no interest of emptying um, those countries of, of, uh, of people and of quality um, uh, knowledge. Uh, so so that the, we have an interest of making uh, a wider European uh, Union area um, uh, flourish and in balance. Ms. Huber, I see you um, nodding and agreeing. So rule of law and especially preventing brain drain, but rather maybe fostering brain circulation as the top priorities. Would you add maybe other priorities to that? Yes, of course, I, I fully subscribe to, to what was just said. Um, and I would just uh, like to mention the, the economic field and, and challenges, uh, especially now with the effect of the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, like the whole world, um, also the, the Western Balkans region has to or will have to recover from, from the effects of what's happening um, currently. And I think for this uh, recovery, it will uh, also need intensified European support. There is uh, now an economic and investment plan in the pipeline, um, which uh, hopefully will be implemented um, as of, of 2021. But these are, of course, long, long-term projects uh, in the area of infrastructure, uh, climate change, uh, digitalization. Um, but, but I think uh, the, the EU has to really also put focus on this area, especially as um, we have already heard, there are many other interested parties, um, huge countries uh, that see their chances in the region who are investing. Uh, intensively and um, so I think here the EU has to, to speed up a little bit. Continuing with this, Ms. Wett, do you think that the European Union with all the challenges that we have also uh, talked about that the EU internally is facing, and we've mentioned Brexit, we need the recovery plan, uh, we, we have now the new multi-annual financial budget, but also maybe institutional reforms, uh, the, the process of enlargement itself. Do you think that the EU will manage, and when I say EU, rather the member states of the European Union, will they manage to agree on making enlargement a priority given all these other problems that are present? Um, well, maybe not an immediate priority. I mean, in that enlargement has always been a priority and it is one of the top agenda points at every ministerial meeting. So, so that's absolutely clear. But of course, uh, now there are other challenges like the economic challenges and the health sector and um, what we are facing um, this year. But there are so many pressing issues with regard to the accession process, which uh, also the EU has to put focus on, again, like um, the negotiating frameworks and now back to the uh, technical level for, for Albania and, and North Macedonia and to find an agreement here. Um, so these are not huge steps uh, for the EU or uh, its member states, but would be huge steps for the region. And, and I think here we have to uh, refocus again um, in the EU. Ambassador Wolfer, do you think it can become a priority or are you more pessimistic in that sense? Short term, I think uh, attention is, 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 is somewhere else. But I would not think that a new dynamic could uh, come up um, before long. Um, we have now, uh, these days, we will have a new administration in the United States. Uh, which is uh, potentially can be very important and very helpful. Uh, we should fairly um, admit that the United States over the last decades have been um, of great support for the region, for stability, for assuring um, positive developments. Uh, every, every time the European Union, Europe and the United States really work hand in hand, progress and even big progress um, can be achieved. So I would be vaguely optimistic. I mean, we are facing 
few changes now. There will be uh, general elections in Kosovo uh, next month in February uh, 2021. Uh, already uh, there will be uh, general elections in Serbia. We know already that uh, they, they will happen um, early next year, 2022. So I wonder if there can be, be big progress um, in this field. But on the other hand, uh, regarding Bosnia Herzegovina, with all the, the problems that there may be, there could be a, a new um, dynamism that will be elections held now in the, on the federal level and in Bosnia altogether, and, but also uh, municipal elections were done in, in the city of Mosta, which had not been happening for a long time. 21 is a, a year without elections, with a new um, uh, administration in Washington, so maybe uh, maybe there can be progress. We always have to be optimistic. And as far as act, uh, enlargement process, there would be elections in Bulgaria, and maybe then with a, a new energy and a new um, clear um, uh, mind. Um, also in this respect, uh, a new progress is is possible. It's always an uphill struggle and a long term uh, process, but we should not uh, give up and. Um, Maybe um, once the attention is not so much on overcoming pandemic because it will have been overcome, then uh, Europe can concentrate more on getting uh, their overall act together and to be a major player in this uh, global competition, which there is. It should be a peaceful competition, but competition it will be. Thank you. Well, I hope uh, that... I will uh, be able to share your optimism when it when it comes to enlargement because when you when you look at the time span that already passed and it's I think especially for the people a very frustrating process because it's not so easy to comprehend why does it take so long and and where is the goal that we are actually you know because with just because when you join the European Union not everything magically is going to be uh, better for you immediately even that will then take uh, some time, and it's probably hard to convey this to the general population in uh, the countries of the Western Balkans. To maybe finish up with our very interesting discussion here, I would like to um, ask you um, what if this process is, is not something that will go through the foreseen steps with fulfilling the criteria, closing the chapters, and then accessing. Do you think there are alternative scenarios that are possible and also viable for the Western Balkan countries, or even scenarios where we have steps that would make it easier to understand that they are coming closer to a new membership? Yeah, this is an important and thorny um, issue and a, a good question. Of course, there's nothing else than a accession process, and that is it. This is the official standpoint. Of course, everybody asks themselves, how will we really proceed uh, from now on? Uh, are there alternatives? What could be, um, especially the countries of the Western Balkans, so far they have uh, totally discarded any other way forward than uh, full accession. This has been promised to them, I see their point. To be promised to them, uh, this is on the agenda, has been restated over and over. So why give in and, and say, well, okay, we don't need full uh, uh, accession, we will we'll settle for something else. Realistically, of course, um, other people um, reacting and uh, trying to find more practical ways uh, forward. It has been the idea on the table of uh, the Western Balkan countries accessing a kind of a European economic area like uh, Austria uh, and other countries had been member of before joining, fully joining the European Union with a high degree of uh, interaction, full, all the full uh, for freedoms, a high degree of integration already. This is one of the things uh, that are on the table and uh, no, they're not on the table, but they're being discussed and they're being openly discussed by politicians, by political scientists. They're here. Things are happening. Uh, some countries have already been uh, admitted to the NATO now, I'm not saying the NATO is, is the same thing as the European Union, but it's also a, a form of integrating uh, countries into wider areas where most European countries are members of. Ms. Huber, alternative scenarios, possibilities? 
Yes, of course, um, that's that's a highly also sensitive um, uh, discussion. But I think with uh, this very slow process, of course, it will become a, a very obvious discussion um, in, in the near future. But in the meanwhile, I would just like to add... Um, for the information of listeners, um, that already now um, there is a new methodology of uh, the accession process on the table, uh, which will be implemented as of, of this year. And uh, this new methodology uh, includes a lot of um, sticks, uh, makes it even more, more difficult to a certain degree with higher demands uh, regarding reforms in the era of rule of law and uh, democratic institutions, as we already mentioned. But on the other side, um, it also opens the possibility for sort of partial, fast integration in areas where the countries have shown necessary reforms or were able to adopt the dear key. Um, so that's, that is the part of, of the carrots um, of, of this new methodology. And this might also go a bit in the direction that within this enlargement process, um, there are new ways and tracks to include and, and um, to offer some new incentives also for, for the candidate countries to, to implement reforms faster in order to be able to participate in, in certain programs or policy fields earlier. Thank you very much. I think we are going to monitor the process and the progress, um, not only here at IDM, but also I think in general, and uh, we will continue to exchange with you. I would like to say thank you very much again to Tunne Huber and uh, Ambassador Wölfer for taking their time and discussing this with us. It was a very, very interesting insight into how this enlargement process is working. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise. And of course, also thank you everyone who's listening. To us, this was Central Europe Explained, becoming an EU member, an IDM podcast series powered by Erste Group. We are looking forward to the next episode and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. IDM Podcast. Institute für den Donauraum und Mitteleuropa. Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe. European Perspectives. Regional Actions. Cooperation and expertise since 1953.